Welcome to DLS's student webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about learning a complicated language. Here's what this webinar will address. We'll talk about dealing with challenging languages. Then we'll talk about why English is also difficult, how we learn languages, even the hard ones, and we'll wrap up with some practical tips and things to keep in mind. We all know that languages are complex, but they can be complex and challenging to us for very different reasons. Some languages have really difficult pronunciation, maybe tones or maybe sounds that don't exist in our first language. Of course, some languages have very complex grammar structures. Sometimes languages have different writing systems. That's always difficult. The spelling might not match the pronunciation. For example, if you're learning French, and of course, a big factor is how similar or different the language is to our first language. So here are just a few examples of some pretty challenging elements of a few languages. So Turkish, um, which is a category three language on the FSI scale of difficult languages, um, four being the highest. Uh, you can see here that the word order in Turkish is almost totally different to what it is in English. So this sentence, biz bunu süpariş etmemiştik, uh, it means we didn't order this, something you might say in a restaurant, but you can see the literal translation here where the verb comes at the end and the word order is, is just totally different from what it is in English. Another uh, famous or maybe infamous, depending on your point of view, feature of Turkish is that it has very long words. So you can see here this um, this sentence, these two words, evlerin demiş çesine rahatlar. They were as com comfortable as if they were in their own house. So all of those English words are just two Turkish words. Um, so that's quite challenging in Turkish. Uh, Pashto again is uh, is a difficult language, uh, and again the word order presents a challenge for students of that language as well. Uh, so the verb is at the end of the sentence. Russian um, is another category three language. The case endings are challenging for learners. It has a different alphabet. There's no to be verb in the present. So if you want to say, I am a student, you say, I student. And then um, the vocabulary can also be challenging. So in English, we have one, one word when we want to say to go, um, but Russian has different verbs of motion. So you can see all of these uh, different verbs here, which describe how you're going somewhere. Um, so we can see that these, these are some difficult elements here. And then a few more examples. Uh, we know that Chinese can be specifically challenging because of its tones. Um, and if you say a word with the wrong tone, you're saying a completely different word. Um, this language, uh, ko or ta, which is spoken in Botswana and Namibia. Uh, some say it's one of the most difficult languages to learn, and it has 100 different sounds, whereas English has only 44 sounds. So over twice as many sounds as English. And then of course, other languages have different writing systems. Japanese has three different writing systems. So, you're probably already thinking of different examples of things that have been challenging for you in your target language or one of your target languages. And take a moment to think of something specifically that has been a challenge for you recently. Um, and think about, was it grammar, pronunciation? Was it to do with the vocabulary or maybe something else altogether? And just take a moment to think of that. When we're learning a new language, we can often forget that our first language, English, uh, is also a very challenging language and very complex. So we're going to look at a few things uh, in English that are particularly challenging for people who are learning English and then see what light that sheds on the language learning process. So here's one example of things that present difficulties for English language learners. Uh, 
which is words that are spelled the same, but have different meanings and different pronunciations. Another big challenge in English is that pronunciation and spelling do not match and are not consistent. Um, so here you can see this example word. This is kind of a famous example um, for people who struggle, who are struggling to learn English. It's how do you think this word would be pronounced? And it could be pronounced fish if you take the GH from enough, the O from women, and the TI from motion, that would make fish. Um, here are a few other examples. Um, cough, through, bow, though, and hiccup. All of these are spelled the same, but have very different pronunciation. Um, so English, English's pronunciation and spelling are really not consistent. This is also a problem in languages like French, uh, for example, which presents the same challenge to learners. And then uh, a few more final challenges in English. Um, for English pronunciation, the TH sound, like in think, three, or thought, uh, is extremely challenging. It's a sound uh, that doesn't exist in a lot of languages, um, and many speakers of English who are very proficient um, and can communicate with ease and fluency still never really master this sound. Um, and in fact, as English is becoming a more international language, um, used by second language speakers to talk to other second language speakers of English, um, some linguists predict that this TH sound will start to fade out of English uh, within the next 50 years or so. Another challenge uh, in English, we can see here this question, what does the word get mean? Uh, this was a question that one of my students asked me when I was teaching English. And if you think about it for a moment, it's a pretty difficult question to answer. Um, so get can mean of course, receive, uh, like you get a salary every two weeks, but it can also mean become, like it's getting dark or oh, I'm getting cold, or it might mean you cause something to happen. So you might say, oh, I'm getting my sink fixed or I'm getting my house painted. And then if it combines with other words, it can have a totally different meaning. So get up means wake up, get over something, get by, we're making enough money to get by. Oh, I'll get to that task on Monday. I didn't get to it today. But get to can also mean arrive at a destination. Well, we're getting to the airport around five. Um, or you might say, oh, I'm getting out of getting out of the car. Um, so we can see that this one word get has so many different meanings uh, that, you know, students just have to learn each meaning in its separate context and use the context to kind of try to figure out what's going on in the sentence. So from these examples, we can see that even though English feels effortless and easy to us, um, if we speak it as our first language, it presents real challenges and complications to people who are learning it. So let's take a look at what this tells us about how we learn languages. So sometimes when faced with these really complicated problems of grammar and pronunciation, we might think of language like a really complex math problem or physics problem, something that we have to work really hard to understand and figure out and we kind of have to break our brains to, to get it. But that's not exactly um, how we learn languages. Now, linguists and language researchers don't know exactly how we learn languages. They're still very much studying this process in the brain and figuring out exactly what happens. There are, however, several widely accepted theories, and all of them agree that there are two types of learning that happen when we, when we study a language, and those are learning and acquiring or acquisition. So let's take a moment to define those terms. Learning is when we consciously learn the rules and try to apply them. So for this example, you might study the past tense in Spanish and try to remember the different verb endings. Acquisition, on the other hand, is when you're doing something in the target language, uh, listening to a story, you're trying to communicate, and you're focused on meaning, and 
in that moment, you might not be trying to learn, but you still pick things up and you might not even realize that you're learning them. And both of these types of learning happen uh, when we study a language. So we can already see here that this is different. Uh, this is something different than the example of working on a really difficult math problem where we're focused and our brains are working so hard trying to figure it out and we're really focused on learning it, is that in language, we have these two types of learning. We have learning, which is conscious, and we're putting in effort. And then we have acquisition, where we're focused on trying to communicate. But even in that moment, we're still learning, even if we don't realize it. One way to think of language learning is to think of it as how you might learn a skill. So think of some skill that you know, uh, maybe riding a bike, for example, or playing tennis, playing the piano, driving a car. Um, and think about how you learned or might learn that skill. So you might start out, for example, with a teacher or watching YouTube tutorials, maybe. Um, and then you practice slowly and you often make a lot of mistakes. But eventually that skill becomes automatic. You can do it easily and without thinking about it. And in many cases, uh, this metaphor applies to language learning, where we might start out with a teacher or learning something, and then we have practice where we make a lot of mistakes, and it's very slow and we can't do it very, we can't do it with ease. Uh, it's very difficult, but eventually, whatever it is that we're learning becomes automatic. We can do it easily and we don't even have to think about it. And that kind of automatic ability, that's what we see with our first language, where we know English, we can use it, we don't even have to think about it. So have you experienced this uh, phenomenon where there's something in your target language that once seemed impossible and you could barely maybe understand it or get the words out, but now you can do it with ease. Uh, think of an example, and I'll give you a couple examples of my own. Um, so here you can see this word, uh, that's a neighborhood in Istanbul. And when I lived in Turkey, um, this word was just impossible for me to pronounce. Um, but after time, uh, it became easy and I could say it without thinking. Uh, so this sentence means mejidiyakoi chalashiorum. Um, so think of your own example where something once seemed impossible, but now you can do it effortlessly. And then one final point to keep in mind here is that our brains are built to learn languages. Uh, they're built to process and to store languages. So when we have input, and when we say input, that just means something that we read or something that we listen to. When we have input that we understand and the opportunity for meaningful interaction, so talking to someone or having a conversation, then we will learn the language. Um, and sometimes this might be conscious learning uh, or it might sometimes be acquisition. We might learn it uh, without realizing it or we might pick something up without realizing it. Now, with all that having been said, let's look at some practical tips and things to keep in mind when faced with these challenging uh, languages. So one thing that it's really helpful to do is to have realistic goals and break things into, into smaller pieces or chunks. So when you're working on a new grammar structure or maybe a new set of vocabulary, uh, don't try to take on too much at once. Um, for example, uh, if you're maybe working on hypothetical structures in Spanish, uh, instead of trying to learn all of them at one time, focus only on one at a time. And this will make it easier for you to uh, kind of digest, uh, to process the meaning, and then to, uh, to get better at that particular structure. So you might think of this, um, you know, if you think of language as a skill, you might think about how sometimes you might practice, for example, in tennis, a specific move over and over again. Like you might practice serving over and over again uh, before you go in and play a game of tennis. 
And one thing that uh, is also extremely important to keep in mind is that whatever you do in the target language should be meaningful. Um, so you want to try to avoid kind of the rote uh, practice, but really work on making, making things meaningful. So this could look like a lot of different things. There are lots of different types of meaningful practice. These are just a few examples. So having a role play, uh, describing something that you see or that is in your life, telling stories, asking questions when you're in class, or reading and listening to something that interests you in the target language. Uh, we do have other webinars that have many more examples of meaningful practice, so be sure to check those out in our YouTube channel or on Moodle if you're interested. Another thing to keep in mind is that it's important to be patient. Uh, so language learning is, is a long haul task. Um, there are ways to make learning a language more efficient, but there is no shortcut and there's just no way to get around that. Language learning takes time. Um, so, you know, another example here uh, to go back to likening language learning to a sport, uh, if you think about running, you know, if you're training for a marathon, there's there's not really much of a way to, to shortcut that. You have to put in the miles and put in the time. Um, and just like with running, when you're learning a language, it's really important to be consistent, um, set small goals and track your progress, and then just be patient. Um, don't expect it to all happen at once. Now, sometimes with language learning, it can feel like we're not making any progress. Uh, and sometimes that's normal, but on a regular basis, you should be able to, to set smaller goals and to see your progress over time. So if you don't feel like you're seeing progress, then that's something you should talk with your teacher about or maybe talk to your LTS about and talk about some ways for goal setting and tracking progress. And we also have another webinar on this if you're, if you're interested. Thank you so much for watching uh, this webinar on dealing with challenging languages. If you have any questions, fe please feel free to follow up with me or with your LTS. And we hope that this was useful for, to you. Thank you very much.